it was in, in the practice of the Prophet Sallam that he would he would always remind us uh, by saying Allahumma uh, Allah man fa'na ma'alamtana wa'allamna wa'allimna ma'yanfa'una wa zidna ilma he would say oh Allah benefit us with that by that which you taught us and alimna teach us that which will benefit us and increase us in knowledge um, I don't uh, regard myself as a knowledgeable person as the brother was saying uh, it was also in his practice that he would say Allahumma la tu'akhidni bima yaqoolun wa ghfirli ma la ya'lamun wa ja'alni khayra mimma yaqoolun Oh Allah don't take me to account for what they say about me and forgive me for what they don't know about me and make it better than what they think about me and this of course is in the way of 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 what Solomon is teaching for us so that we maintain always humility and particularly humility and knowledge he would also say every day after Fajr Allahumma inni asaluka ilman nafi'an what is tayyiban wa amma taqbalan all I ask you for beneficial knowledge and a pure provision and accepted actions and we, of course we remember the words of our great scholars like Imam Malik Shafi'i would say because of the riwayat knowledge isn't you know in many narrations it is that which impacts the heart and you could find therefore a person who knows less narrations but he has uh, a lot of taqwa of Allah and therefore his his closeness to Allah is a determinant. May Allah make us all close to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is really wonderful being in the presence of such wonderful people as yourselves. Um, and I really am honored to be here and I ask Allah to bless and increase all of you in, in Iman and in this beautiful place your school the running, the school that's running, and in this program that you have running for a long time, may Allah give you ziyadah and increase in all of your affairs and jazakallah uh, for Sitting next to me and <laughs> keeping me safe. You know? <laughs> There's a couple of people that quite happy. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, I thought Brother was going to do the talk today because we were just like, <laughs> he just backed off and he flew through me. No works. <laughs> <laughs> we all learn from one another anyway, I'm good enough. Uh, so I think therefore, you know, Landolus is, is, I think, one of the most um, remarkable. Uh, points of our Islamic long Islamic history and from which we learned so many so many a lesson and I was in Al-Andalus just recently Al-Andalus is of course Spain um, Muslims uh, were in Spain for several hundred years and Spain by the way is the largest country in the entirety of Europe and it was a land in which we had the Khalif was there the Khilafah was there we had Muslim Islamic civilization in Al-Andalus for a very long time um, but it's also perhaps the only place in the world where Islam was established in full and then removed in full. And it's hard to think of another place anywhere in the world like that, where Islam was established in full and then removed in its entirety. And that's something, again, that should uh, ring alarm bells for all of us and make us think about how significant that place must actually be for us. It was in the early part of the 8th century, the 7-11 of Muslims, they they crossed the Straits of Gibraltar from the Maghrib, from Morocco, and entered into Al-Andalus. And there was the governor of Africa, was a man called Musa ibn Musayr. And he had a, uh, an ex-slave he appointed, who became a you know, free man, uh, Tariq ibn Ziyad, who he appointed um, as the emir of uh, the um, Tangier. Tangier is to the furthest northwest of, of the Maghrib of Morocco. Uh, to the furthest northeast of the Maghrib, in fact, is a place called Quetta. And Quetta was ruled by a man called, um, who knows his name? Julian. Julian, because I just forgot actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Julian. Yeah, exactly. There's no one knows him. The road down. <laughs> his name was Julian. And so. Uh, now there are, there are two main accounts, but some of them emerged quite later, like in the 16th century, about uh, how the Muslims arrived into Al-Andalus. One of them is a very famous story that Julian, he had a problem with the king, the Visigothic king of Spain called Roderick, that he sent his daughter to study one of King Roderick's school, and she was abused there. She became known as La Sava Sa Romia, as the, as the, as the seductress. So Christians painted her negatively, um, but others saw her as a victim. In any case, that's one story. So therefore, when he, uh, Julian wanted revenge against King Roderick, he therefore enlisted help of the Muslims, and uh, notably Tariq ibn Ziyad, Muslim ibn Nasir, to go into Al-Andalus and, and capture it, conquer it. That's one story. 
The other one is that the Visigoths, who were the main people, the, the kings of Spain, uh, were having problems, turmoil, civil war, just before like in 710 civil war, uh, there was corruption, there was oppression, uh, injustice against the Jews primarily and other small groups, and so the Muslims who went there um, to try and, and, and restore a sense of order into, into, into Spain. Uh, the Visigothic people, by the way, were a people who were Christians, but they were recent converts to Catholicism, to, to being Catholics. Just before that, they were Arians. And so Arians uh, were a, a, a sect of, of Christianity uh, who emerged from the 4th century from a priest called Arius. He was a priest who was in the famous Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, you know, that was ordered by, by Constantinople. And he was someone who didn't believe that Jesus was Allah. You know, he believed that Isa alayhi salam was less than Allah. Therefore, his followers believed the same. And so therefore, these, these people in, in, in Spain who were previously Aryans were forced to become Catholics. Uh, when the Muslims arrived in Al-Andalus, uh, that message of Tawheed of La ilaha Allah resonated with them quite strongly because they thought, well, this is a bit like what we used to practice before. A bit like, not altogether, but a bit like. And so when the Muslims therefore arrived in Al-Andalus, um, you know, there was a very, a very big battle called the Battle of Guadalat in which King Roderick was defeated by the Muslim by Tariq ibn Ziyad. Uh, him and Musa ibn Nusayr then met together with the, with the infantry and cavalry um, and, and they began to, you know, march northwards and taking territory. Um, a lot of states fell willingly, like Toledo fell without resistance. Uh, Cordoba, in fact, there was resistance in Cordoba with a long siege. Uh, some places fell because they embraced Islam quite immediately. Others they accepted Muslim rule, but others, however, refused. And those who refused were mostly the Visigothic nobility. They fled northwards, as far north as they could go, and as far north as you go, there could be these mountains. These are called the mountains of Astoria, Astoria's mountains and Galicia mountains. So Muslims were therefore taking territory, but these Visigothic you know, nobility were traveling further north and they get to the north where there's mountains and so Muslims didn't didn't bother themselves with going all the way up north because they thought well what's the point they're gonna die out soon enough anyways only three of them and uh, that's one reason second reason is because they had cavalry and it's hard, hard for horses to go up that, that high and number three because it was bad weather right and they didn't want to get you know drenched in the rain and stuff like that, you know. And so, uh, they just didn't bother them that much. Although there was one small campaign in which Muslims were defeated by these Visigothic nobility. For the Christians today, it's a very big thing. It's, uh, it's even, there's even a shrine, you know, remembering the, the defeat of the Muslims in that battle. Um, but Muslims had other victories and that was happening. And so therefore, for the first, you know, 20, 30 years, there was, there was conquest taking place in, in Spain. Um, there were three major battles between the Muslims and the Christians, not just in Spain, but now in France. And so Muslims therefore had, had surpassed Spain and had entered into France, right? So in the year 721, there was, um, there was uh, a battle in, in Aquitaine, you know, against the Christians. Uh, Duke Odo of Aquitaine was a ruler. He launched a surprise attack against a Muslim wazir called Asam ibn Malik al Khawlani, and in which he was killed. Um, the next ruler was Man Abdurrahman al Rafiqi. He launched his attack in the year 730 uh, in Aquitaine itself. In that battle, the Muslims were victorious, but again, the Duke Odo had fled and he went to seek help from a man called Charles Martel. Uh, his name is very famous you know, in Christian history, uh, particularly in French history, a lot, because Charles Martel is believed to be the man who was the most decisive in, um, in defeating the Muslims. And this happened in the year 732, in, again in France, you know, in a place called Tours. Um, the, the Muslims met Charles Martel in this, in, uh, in this battlefield, and they had advantage of, of being on a, on a tall hill, the Christians did. And they organize themselves in what's called a flanks. A flanks is like this rectangular mass of people from Greek warfare times. The Muslims were cavalry. They didn't have the advantage because the others were on a hill and they had a very strong infantry. And they used the cover of the trees to disguise themselves. 
Uh, it was quite a long siege. It was October, November time. Muslims were, weren't prepared for the winter. And so uh, Charles Martel then and his army, they launched an attack in which the Muslims were defeated. Um, and that really marked the end of Muslim going anywhere further than in France since that time until today. So that, that's how, how far the Muslims got at that time. But back to Al-Andalus then, that was where the focus was. Muslims began to establish kingdoms, you know, kingdoms in all these states. Uh, 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 Jaros, uh, Arkez, Asija, uh, Seville, Cordoba, Granada, Toledo, all these places were now Muslim states. And Muslims are uh, having quite a, a, a quick succession of governors, which is one of, in hindsight, it was seen as a weakness, but that's why they were doing it. Um, until they established settlements. And the main places where Muslims really settled were places like Cordoba. And so Cordoba, this is on our journey, we just traveled from there recently, and so we went from Malaga to to Cordoba, you know, from London to Malaga, Malaga to Cordoba. Anybody who's been to Cordoba would know Cordoba is, it was known as, as a marvel of the world in that time. There was no city in Europe anywhere that could rival Cordoba. Cordoba was known as a city of 10,000 lights, meaning it was a lighted city in the nights. And there was no street lights anywhere, anywhere in Europe. Cordoba had 10,000 of them. In Cordoba, there were 600 masajid. Imagine, in one city, 600 mosques, 300 libraries. In Cordoba, it means Muslims are actually reading and learning, taking literacy seriously. Uh, 50 hospitals in Cordoba, right? They had irrigation, they had a sewage system, that things were clean, they had hygiene, they had hammams, they had public baths, right? All these things. So it was really a, a city that thrived. And then within and from this environment emerged great scholars like, you know, Imam Qurtubi. Imam Qurtubi is the Imam of, of Qurtubi. Qurtubi, you know. Uh, and others, uh, Ibn Zawar, great scientists were emerging, people who were learning about, you know, physics and uh, a Zaharawi, for example, the, the master of surgery. And many of his surgical instruments, in fact, are still used in hospitals today. Uh, and he drew more than, I think, 280 different types of surgical instruments and how to use them and how and not how not to use them in his books. And these are being studied by the Muslims and they're excelling in things like maths and science. At the same time, however, also was happening in Baghdad in the Dar al Hikmah, where, where you get like uh, the Kitab al Hisab wal Jabbar of this is where algebra comes from, you know, or al Khawarizmi, where you get algorithms, al Khawarizm, algorithm, the same, same name. Muslims are, are, are focusing on astronomy. Muhammad ibn Fatu made the astrolabe, right? But it isn't only about a male endeavor, like males doing it, men doing it. What about the women? Uh, we know of Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, the great scholar Ibn Hazm, and he was one of the main teachers in, in Qurtaba. And, uh, you know, when his classes used to finish, then his daughter, who was also a great scholar, used to run the classes, you know, for the women. And you had so many makatib. Makatib was schools, just like this school now, for example, sometimes small gardens, sometimes large, where they would begin in the morning. All kids would memorize Quran. That was the main thing curriculum at the beginning. Kids had to memorize the Quran. Arabic, Arabic poetry. What about, like, in Seville, you had uh, women poetesses, like uh, 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 Al-Ghassama. Al-Ghassama, Maria of Seville, you had... Um, you know, uh, Safiya Ishbiliya, these are women who are princesses sometimes of the Muslim rulers, the Mohidun. Uh, sometimes they were experts in drama, in, in oratory skills, in manuscript illumination. They were, they were remarkable in poetry and they were known to be, you know, masters of their time in these sciences. And so, uh, you know, these city centers were really thriving at that time. In Seville, for example, uh, was known for botany. The studying of plants, right? So in Seville, you had people like Abu Khair. Abu Khair was the book called Kitab al Filaha, the book of farming. Uh, <coughs> Ibn al Awam Ishbili, this is 12th century now, he, he wrote a book where he described more than 500 types of plants, right? So if you asked us to name, like, let's say we had a contest, so let's name a plant each, you know, we just had not get very far with that, you know. <laughs> you imagine, you know, like, you know, you know. But he, he, he's, so in his book, there's hundreds of different types of plants, and then not just the plant, but the plant, where to grow the plant. 
right? And how to look after the plant. And they're really taking this thing seriously. Uh, Ibn al-Baytah was another one. That was his contemporary, Ibn al-Baytah. Al-Khafiqi was another one, remarkable in both. They all write these amazing books um, about, you know, soil and collecting rainwater and fertilization and plants. And, and, and Seville, therefore, was known, was known as that. Um, and then places like, you know, other places, Toledo was another one. Um, and this really went on, you know. But then they came, they came, and I'm trying to encapsulate 800 time, years of Muslim rule in, in the short time <coughs> we have together here. But I want to take a lesson today, which is about about landscapes and landscaping, right? And transitioning from land. Allah in the Quran he says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Inna ja'alna ma'ala al-ardi zinata laha linabluhum ayyum ahsan amala. Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, Inna ja'alna ma'ala al-ardi zinata laha. We've made whatever is on the earth zinata laha as an adornment for it, for the earth. لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنْ عَمَلًا So we could test those who do best in it. Allah didn't just make the world beautiful so we can observe it and see it. Those who can do best in it. And this is a very important thing for us to remember about how best we could do wherever we are. Allah in the Quran says, سُتُ الْمُلِكِ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَالْحَيَاتِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنْ عَمَلًا that Allah has created death and life to bless those who are best in action. In the Quran, Allah says, Subhanallah, Allah says, Thumma ja'alnaakum, min ba'di, Allah, Allah, Thumma ja'alnaakum, khala'if fil ardi min ba'di, min nanzul kifa ta'maloon. And then Allah says, we will make you, after them, inheritors in the land, min nanzul kifa ta'maloon, so we could see how you act. Not just about what you do, how you do. When Abu Bakr became Khalifa, Umar says to him, You know, Allah made you Khalifa, illa liyanzur, kayfa ta'mal, except Allah wanted to see how you do, how you act. He began his Khilafah by saying, Well, lead to alaykum, well, as to be khayrikum, I am appointed of you, but I'm not the best of you. What's going to be now the train of his rulership, right? With what kind of ethic and what kind of moral code would he run his society? And so that was really a great test for the Muslims because they're entering into a new landscape. This is away from the Middle East. And anybody who's been to Spain knows it's so beautiful. Right? The atmosphere, the, the weather, this it's, a, it's so stunning scenery. Or being in Seville or Cordoba, this was new for them, but how would they behave in that? And so what happened, therefore, <coughs> is that, you know, after some time, the Muslims fell into dispute. Right, so they fell into dispute and they began began to become divided with one another. And so each of these small small uh, states became an independent autonomy, you know, an independent states, uh, where they then enlisted armies against the other one, and they had no central leadership and they had no like you know no ruling really. And this really became the, the beginning of, of the downfall of the Muslims. Muslims had the greatest time under the rulership of the Khalif, of the Rahman III. Of the Rahman III, you know, he built a city called Medina al Zahra. And this city he built, really, you know, the 10,000 workmen were working on this city. And he built this city as a show to show the Western world, like, you know, the diplomats coming from places like Constantinople and Rome and other places, that this is what the Muslims are achieving in, in Spain. And they didn't have anything like it. And this was to show them. And he built this city from scratch, you know, Madun to Zahra. They say he named it after his wife. I think Zahra was her name or his daughter. Uh, and it was just remarkable, stunning. You know, gold and silver and these fountains and amazing, you know, plants and they even had a zoo, wild animals, they had ostriches and elephants you know, and tigers in, in his zoo. And they had, it was just to show this is our splendor of everything, <coughs> you see. But look at this, this is a great lesson for all of us because that city lasted only 70 years. The entire city was then destroyed by another group of the Muslims, the Muahidun. When they came from the mother, you know, the Berbers, when they came, they destroyed all of it because they, they saw that as excessive. So maybe in their heart they thought it's a good thing what they're doing, you know, because they saw that there's a, there's a problem when your artist, artistry, your artistic talent becomes an indulgence and becomes excessive. And that's how they saw it. And so they destroyed it. Right? We visited the city. Now they've excavated 10% of the city from 1910. 
That meant from that time until 1910, it was under the earth. Nothing could be seen under the earth. And how many lessons do we learn from like Qarun? But when Allah says, you know, Allah says, we gave him. Allah is the one that gives. Allah, Allah gives, bestows. We gave him of treasures. It would have taken a band of strong men, Allah says, to carry the keys to his treasures. It's When his people said to him, don't exalt. Like you get it, you've got it. Now don't exalt, right? Allah doesn't love those who exalt. Like you know, say, just say Allah gave it to you. Just you know, MashaAllah, that quote illa billah. You know, and then they say to him, it's the principle. Wa btali fi ma atakalod al akhir and seek Allah, seek heaven akhira with what Allah gave you. Like if Allah made you strong, seek Allah's happiness with your strength. If Allah made you intelligent, seek Allah's Allah's pleasure with that. If Allah made you wealthy, then think about your investment for the akhir of the wealth that Allah gave you. Right? And they said, and he said, well, I don't, so now see, I mean, don't, don't forget your portion of dunya. It doesn't mean that you give everything away. This is we should have this on in our walls everywhere. And show excellence like unto others the way Allah showed excellence unto you. Be excellent in your disposition the way Allah showed excellence unto you. Right? But it made no difference because He comes along, Qal innama indi. Whatever I have is because of myself. Now, the moment that creeps in that disease of self power, self autonomy, you know, self indulgence. Right? Whatever I have is because of my own skills. I am where I am today because of who I am. It's exactly what Qarun says. So the ulama, they say, don't say three. Ana wali wa indi. Ana, like Iblis said, Ana khayrun min hu, I am better than him. And like Li, like Fir'aun said, Alaysa li mulk Misr, isn't kingdom of Egypt for me. And like Indi, like Qarun says, <coughs> What I have is my stuff, you know. And then the second one, of course, was one was the verbalizing, the second was the, the actualizing. Then Allah says He comes out to His people to show them everything that He has. Like, this is my son, I'm not just saying it, I'm going to show you it all of it. And then the people, when they saw it, they said, You know what? If only we could have what Qarun has. Right? And then Allah says, فَخَسَفْنَ بِهِ And Allah caused the earth to swallow him and all of his stuff, all of his estates. And it's like when you see the landscape of where the Medina Zahra was supposed to be, that 10% of it, and you think you've been under the earth for hundreds of years. And just now, it's 1910, the small bits and pieces of your, of your relics, of your artifacts have been the jugs that they used to use and the small carvings and everything, and that's it. But what a lesson Allah is giving us in the Quran and all this. So whatever we have, remember, it's not about whatever we build in this life, it's whatever we invest in the next for the next life. To build a home for for ourselves in heaven, may Allah grant all of us for those of that I mean. And so therefore, this is Abdul Rahman the third. He had a Jewish diplomat called Hastaib al Shaprut, uh, who he used to he by himself also used to be remarkable in translating Arabic works into Hebrew. And this was ongoing by that time. And so you had people like, um, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Adelard of Bath. Adelard of Bath was one of them. Michael Scott was another one of them. Um, and these were Western, you know, uh, students who would come and learn in the great city centers of Cordoba in the schools, uh, you know, in Toledo, learn Arabic. They would learn the sciences. They would translate the mathematical tables, like, you know, of uh, Al Khawarizmi, the Zij. Uh, they would take the works of Ibn Rushd. Um, uh, Maimonides, you know the uh, Maimon, uh, the the Jewish uh, philosopher, his works. They would translate those works into Catalan, Castilian, Portuguese, um, into Hebrew, into Latin, and they would take those works to England, right? So they can tell them this is what Muslims are actually doing in in Kurtuba. and they weren't doing. It. And then they would, of course, learn it. And then they would advance it and they would use it. This became the beginning, the birth of the Western Renaissance was based upon what they were learning from the Muslims in Qurtuba, in the land of you know. 
And so, um, and so, but, but as they're now beginning to excel in this, the Muslims are beginning to, to cave in because they're just becoming devices and divisive and divided with one another. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, during this period of, of division of the Muslims, the Christians of the North, remember we spoke about them in the beginning, like the guy, the man's name was Peleo, he was uh, appointed as king of the Christians in the North. Uh, of course, he's long dead, but all of the descendants now, that small, small grouping has now grown, uh, would begin to march downwards. And they would notice this division amongst the Muslims. Of course, division is weakness. Now, Prophet said that division is adab, it's punishment. And the Jama'ah, the unity is rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they would march downwards and they would, they would pick off these states one by one. They would defeat them one by one until the Muslim kings had to pay like an annual tribute just to be saved from the Christians. So imagine that. Muslims had the entirety of Andalus except the north. And now that small north grouping has grown in number and size and is marching downwards to defeat the Muslims uh, one by one, right? Until they're paying annual tributes for that, right? And this just shows the effect of division. If I was to think, what was it that led to the downfall of Muslims? I would think about two things, dunya and division. Dunya and division. That dunya, it goes back to the verse in the Quran, Allah gave you zinat al like the adornment of the world, so Allah could test how you <coughs> act in it. So Allah could test what you do in it, how do you act in it. Not that you kind of cover it, and you keep it for yourself, and this is mine, it belongs to me and nobody else, and that's it. I mean, that's the failing. That's the tragedy. Right? It began to happen like that. You know, so all of these main iconic landscapes were just to show this is what we have and this is what I have and you don't have it, you know. And so the Christians therefore became powerful and began to defeat the Muslims one by one until they lost states like Cordoba and they lost Seville, right? And, and then what happened is that from all of these major city centers, they're all migrating to Granada. Granada became the one city center, the one state where all the Muslims had to migrate to. And then it became a thriving city for more than a hundred years. Granada, you know, they built it up, they expanded it, it grew in population, it grew in, you know, art, artist, artistry, all the scientists and the luminaries and artists are coming to Granada and they're making it really a, an amazing city. And they built in Granada, maybe you've seen or visited, the Alhambra Palace, right? And the Alhambra Palace is really uh, a wonder of the world. I think it's just absolutely amazing, stunning. And you think to yourself, how do they even do that? And you notice it when you go to Alhamra, you might notice that everywhere on the walls is written, La ghaliba illallah. La ghaliba illallah. There's no victor except Allah. It says, Al mulku lillah, Al qudratu lillah, Al qudratu lillah, Al izzatu lillah. Everywhere. And so I, when I saw that, I thought to myself, did they do that? Because they knew that they were now in circle. And then what else could they say? Well, there's nothing else to say, right? So now is the time for us to say, Oh Allah, you know, لا غالب إلا الله There's no victor except Allah. I mean, we're, we're just completely surrounded. We're not going to come out of here. And so we're going to say, Oh Allah, there's no victor except you. القدرت لله The power is for Allah. العزة لله The honor is for Allah. Right? Al-mulk lillah, the kingdom is for Allah. It was a way of kind of expressing this and that attirara, the desperation. There's nothing else for us now, Allah. And Allah knows this. You know, but that's how they that's how they saw it, you know. And they made it in a beautiful place. Right? Really, really beautiful place. And so there was even like in the in the tower, the Kamaras in Alhambra, it was believed to be impregnable. They made it in a way they thought was impregnable. And the Muslims might have had an interesting thing about them, that whenever they would make something beautiful, they would keep the outer walls very plain, very plain and simple, simplistic, because they didn't want to promote, promote, like, promote envy. Like for the people, like if they, the enemy saw that, he'd think, oh, this isn't worth capturing. Let's leave it as it is. But inside, it's like heaven. You know, it's, more, it's so beautiful inside. But they wanted to keep the outer walls Simplistic, you know, but I mean that didn't really work all the time because they, they learned this is what the Muslims are doing, you know, and so um, and then you know by the end of by the 13th century, 14th century, 
uh, the Muslims were, were defeated even in Granada also. And, and Allah, and, and one of the poets called Arundi, he wrote a poem at the fall of Seville, 1248. And he said these lines, he said, فَلَا يَغْرَبْ بِطِيبِ الْعَيْشِ insan. This is a lesson for us. It's about history, but learning from history. Well, why many of our great scholars were in fact historians. Imam al-Qurtabi was not just more he was also a historian. Ibn Kathir of the Quran wrote a book on history. al bidaya wa Nihad. Ibn al-Athir, great muhaddith, 12th century, wrote a book, Al-Kamil fi tarikh Book of History. Imam Bukhari. These people were scholars as well as being historians because Allah wants us to learn the lesson from the past so that we don't fall into the same problem all over again. And not just about having an empire like they had, a civilization, not just about having it. It's about what you're going to do once you're there. I mean, Muslims did an amazing thing in the beginning because, you know, when the Muslims arrived, the Jews were persecuted. You had the Visigothic kings like Ricard the first Chinthila, and they would force the Jews to become baptized, force conversions, force to eat pork, you know, drink water, <coughs> all these things. And when the Muslims came, they, they stopped all, they gave them the rights. An amazing thing. Now, when the Christians have taken power again over the Muslims, <coughs> they did the same thing to the Muslims. So the Muslims who are still there, and Christians have taken power over everything, they've lost even Granada. Maybe you know the famous story of Abu Abdullah, the Khan Boabdil, and uh, Isabel and, and, and Ferdinand, you know, the, 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 the Christian kings who took power. Um, the very famous line of you know, when, when Abu Abdullah was leaving, his mother Aisha was with him and he began to weep cry. When he looked back in Granada, we've lost all of it now. And his mother says, Tabki kan nisa lam You're crying like a woman for a land you couldn't defend like a man. <laughs> you know, you're crying like a woman for a land you couldn't defend like a man. You know, and of course, it wasn't entirely all of his fault because at the end of it, he didn't have anything. And even he, him, and his son was his son was fighting against the father, and it just became so divisive. Allah in the Quran is telling us, Don't be like those who divided, and differed and divided. Allah is telling us, Hold fast, all of you, to the rope of Allah. Don't be, don't let small, small, small differences between you turn into some mountains. I think sometimes we're guilty of that. I really believe that. In my experiences, we're guilty of that. Like we want photocopies of ourselves. If you're not a photocopy, I don't accept you. I don't accept because you have to be an exact photocopy of me. Who says Islam is even like that? Islam isn't like, you know, I mean, there are legitimate differences between us, but you still maintain the sense of brotherhood and unity of spirit between you. Don't fall into divisive because that's weakness. And then the enemy, of course, and the biggest one, of course, is shaitan, <coughs> will sow that discord. Like, look, even you see me in speaking, Allah in the Quran says, Tell my servants, Bulli Abadi, to speak beautiful words. Shaitan wants to sow friction between them. So what happens if you don't use good words? It's easy for Shaitan to have an avenue. That maybe did he mean that? Did he mean that? Did he? I don't know. Did he say that? I'm thinking about what happens in family. Disputes between in laws, oh, in laws become outlaws. <laughs> things happen. But things happen. You know, because of words. Easy, easy. But this is just division. May Allah make us a people of unity and strength. In unity, there is strength. You know, Muslims, they learned that lesson very long, but that was a big lesson from Al Andalus. And so the poet said, Everything, when it reaches its point of completion, is going to have a fault. It's going to have a defect. It's going to have a failing. So he says, don't be deceived by the life of this world or human being. And this, these lands aren't supposed to remain forever. And where are the lands? You know, where are the lands of the previous emperors? Where are those who used to enjoy themselves eating food? Where are they now? 
وإنما حازه قارون من ذهب وإن عاد وثمود وقهطان and where is عاد and ثمود and all those things Allah mentions in the Quran previous generations you know civilizations أتاء الكل أمر لا مرد له حتى قضوا فكأن القوم ما كان upon all of them came one affair which they couldn't return from meaning death until حتى قضوا until they passed فكأن القوم ما كانوا and it was as if there wasn't even a people there in the first place and when you see really the landscape of Nita Zahra you think wow you were once upon a time the splendor of the world this is why Muhammad Iqbal the famous Urdu poet he visited the uh, the uh, the grand masjid right which was the grand masjid of Qurtaba they call it today the Mesquita, you know. It was the, the Grand Masjid, Masjid Qurtaba. Al-Idrisi said that it was the most magnificent masjid in the world at that time. And when you go inside it, it looks like a masjid. Horseshoe arches, 19 aisles of horseshoe arches, right? It looks like the, inside like the Prophet's mosque. You know, like the same kind of pattern is inside. It's like that. But it's not, it's a cathedral. And inside it are two chapels. Grand chapel is inside it. And you see Jesus. You see like all these all these things inside it. You say, well, what's happening here? And when you go in to buy the ticket, the man says that the thing says, This is not mosque, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no salah here, no okay. You know, he emphasizes the point. This is not a mosque. You know, emphasize it. and they watch you. What are you gonna do? You know? Because this is you know, the <coughs> But this is the this was a grand mosque at that time. You know, the most beautiful mosque in, in the thing. And Muhammad Iqbal, 1933, was the only one given permission to pray in that masjid. Only one. Given permission. 1933 since since that time? Huh? Yeah, yeah, since that time. And even before that time, since the 16th power. So 1566, I think, they, they added that to chapel. And Henry Ruiz, the man's name was Henry Ruiz, you know. He was like the father of the reconquest for the Christians. And so since that time until like 33, from 93, all the words, only one permission. And in it, he wrote a poem. You can read in Urdu, it's called Masjid al Qurtaba. You know? And so it's too hard to learn, but I learned one line from it. He says, Did I anjam me ha teri zameen, asman ake sadio se teri fazabi azan. You know? Which means, your earth is like heaven. But what a shame and loss today, you can't even call azan inside of you. And that really was the tragedy of not just Masjid Qurtaba, every single masjid became a church. Of all those 500 mosques I'm telling you about in Qurtaba, they all became cathedrals and churches. All of them. All of them. Wasn't a single one that remained a mosque, but remained a church, remained a, a masjid. Right? And then, of course, the period of the reconquest happened. And in the reconquest, it was very brutal. It was like what the Christians were doing to the Jews before the Muslims arrived. So how do you... So they would say things like, okay, so if you're not going to go to Maghrib as a you know, forced force migration, many would die along the way, by the way. Or they would kill them on the boats. And so they would just prefer this, we're just going to stay here. But they would pre pretend to be Christians. They would call them Mor Moriscos. And there's an amazing story about them. Secret Muslims. You know, I'm writing a novel, alhamdulillah, about them, their story. Anyway. So they were secret Muslims. In outwardly they were Catholics, but inside they were still Muslims. Just to, for the sake of, this is Ikra, this is compulsion. That they had an excuse to do that because they, was, they, they were going to be killed at once. And then they had their own language called al Jamiado, which is from, by the way, al jama which means unity, the, the main body. And it was Catalan, Castilian, right, and Latin script and with some Arabic. You know, so they kind of mixed it all up to make it like a code that no one else could work out what it was. And they would hide like the Qasida, like these Qasaid, like poems of praising for the Salam. You know, you know, in 1502, there was a grand fire in Granada. They burnt everything. All the Qur'ans, all the books on history, science, hadith, fiqh, everything, because Arabic was a banned language. The only ones they kept were those that had gold uh, like bindings because they could make money from them you know so two major fires 1502-1526 in Granadian city center they burnt everything these moriscos they hid things 
They hid parchments, you know, pages, manuscripts uh, in, in wall cavities, on ceilings, you know, underground. They, they buried them. They would put them in bottles and bury them. Just so that something could remind, remain of some Quran, something like that. But they lost everything. They lost all of it. Right? And so then these secret Muslims had to learn how to survive. The, uh, the uh, Mufti of Iran, this is Tunisia, gave a fatwa to the, to the Muslims of Al-Andalus who remained there. And he said to them that, you know, your time has now come, like the Prophet described, that a time would come when holding on to Islam would be like holding on to hot coal. That's your time now upon you. But they would have rules because they were all Maliki Madhab. In the Maliki Madhab, you had a man called Yahya ibn Yahya al-Layfi, who studied the Mawtaw from Imam Malik himself in Medina. He was the one that made all the members became Maliki really through him and his effort. But in the Maliki Madhab, you might know that they pray with their hands down. Made it be easy to pray because then they wouldn't know if they're praying in that frame. And in Maliki Madhab, you can look straight as opposed to looking down. Right? So you're just looking straight and your hands are down, you know. They wonder that you're praying. But they would have like in their law book that if you're going to pray, you have to pray with the Bible in front of you. That if they see you bowing, you say, I'm bowing to the Bible, you know. Uh, if you're going to pray, you pray with your back to the wall, right? So if somebody comes in the door, you know, you'll see him before he sees you. You don't pray in the middle of a room, like for example, you know. Uh, that you make tayamma. Tayamma. You know, but, they, but they knew, the Muslims, what they were doing, they knew about the, their laws. And so they would say things like, you just wipe your hands on the walls. Or when you're walking past streets, wipe your hands and then that's going to be enough to make the young one. You know? they even, one of the Maliki Fuqaha, he even said that because they, they, they were learning that these secret Muslims, what they were trying to capture, were ha having all these new laws. They even said, he said, okay, so what you do is you look at the wall. And you look at your hands and you rub your hands. And that's your wudu. What else? Al Ikra in Arabic is, you know, wa'id bil qarb, wa'id bil saif, wa'id bil qatil. It's, you know, when you have Ikra or compulsion, the great Hanafi Imam Jordani says uh, that means if you have the fear of killing, being killed, the fear of the sword, that's your under Ikra, compulsion. And that became enough for them, right? There's accounts they would have to force to eat pork to prove you're not a Muslim. Drink wine to prove curse the person. To prove you're not a Muslim, curse the person. And yet women like Al Kandara, you know, uh, others who are like Quran teachers who refuse and they chose martyrs and public where they said, I believe in the person. They became martyred from them. You know? That one case of Damien Dobet, this is Valencia. Damien Dobet, his name was, you know, and he was this man was faqih. So these secret Muslims have like these secret meetings, it's like here like this for example, this is a good example, like something like this. It must be like this, yeah. But he would say, if you're going to come like to the Halakha Daras, you have to wear, women should wear all perfume, makeup, like wedding clothes, all the finery. And men come with their ties and everything, because it needs to look like a wedding. And he is the faqih, the imam giving a khutbah just to remind him a bit about what is Allah, so they don't forget, and he's holding a lute. He's holding a lute, you know, so that they can see what, if the song comes, this is the wedding, so we're just celebrating, you know, not doing anything, like, you know, you know, and this man was caught, by the way. He was caught, you know, so they even were realizing this is what the Muslims were actually doing. So Inquisition was a terrible, terrible <coughs> time. You know, you had a thing called, the, this was the, Directorum Inquisitorium. This was a, they had a, a book, the, direct, the, the, the guide of how to make the Inquisition happen, how to torture Muslims, extract knowledge from them, until at the end, and that was the end of it. You know, and so they therefore went through di different phases of, of, of really of entering, of establishing justice. You had the great Treaty of Theodomer, and so the Muslims made this treaty with the Jews that they're allowed to have the synagogues and. And no churches can be destroyed, and no crucifixes modeled on the treaty of Omar al-Khattab in Al-Quds in Jerusalem, and the and treaty in Medina, you know, just to make sure that people are treated well. But the moment that the seed of the vision enters, it's like, uh, it's going to grow like cancer and spread like the plague. And that's how it happened. And it's a great lesson for our community. Don't ever be divisive. Never be divided. Always opt for mercy. And always opt for unity. Like Imam Anu would emphasize, and he would say things like, you know, 
Whatever you see, unf, unf, is like harshness. If that ever takes prevalence over mercy, then that is not sharia. He would say, to emphasize the point, like don't be in the way in your mannerism, you don't have to be harsh. Don't be belligerent. Have some space so you allow people to breathe. You know, and I think this is really an important lesson from that we take from al -Andran. The second thing is that we learn, they really use their skills and talents. You know, they really use their skills and talents to, to further the Islamic civilization, to better humanity. A man once came and said, Ya Rasulullah, which people are the most beloved people to Allah? And the Prophet says, الناس, The most beloved people to Allah those bring the most benefit to people. And so why is a man spending all of his time drawing plants? Because he's trying to bring benefit to people. Isn't it? Or surgical instruments or medicine, science. They named so many stars are named after Arab Arab scientists, you know. You know, and science instruments and medicine, medicine, drugs, I mean, the therapeutic, all these things were from an ambulance. It was really the, the beacon of, of, of the, the, the seed of the, of the Renaissance in the West was from an ambulance. And that's our history. The man took us as a tour, you know, the tour guide in, in al Andalus, in al Hamra. And so we have these speakers in the headsets, and we give them back to him at the end and ask him, thank you. He said, no, thank you. This is your history. Yeah. He said, no, thank you, this is your history. In Seville, there's a building called the Al-Khazar, Al-Qasr. And this is, a, so in the outside is all plain, and you go inside, you know. And uh, and so the lady, you know, she's a tour guide, and she's Spanish, and so, so she said to us, so she said, you know, as you can see, uh, it's all very plain from the outside. And she said, you know why it's like that? And so, and she said, you see, it's because the Muslims, they wanted their, their buildings to look like, to resemble the Muslim heart. She said, so, no, what are you talking about? And then she said, Dude, so it's all plain. On the, and then said, you go further in, and you start seeing some uh, inscriptions on the walls and calligraphy. And then she said, okay, now it's getting more beautiful. And then you go further in, and it's getting really beautiful. And so she said, you see, they had in their mind that it doesn't matter how you look on the outside. It's a matter of how, how good your heart is in the inside. Wow. <laughs> and I said, well, what a good Islamic lesson that is. Our Prophet said, In Allah, Allah doesn't look at your shapes and your images, Allah looks at your hearts. That's what Allah said. And so then in, in the house, the inner place, there's even a house, there's a, there's a room, the inner, inner, inner room in the Al-Qasa, they, they built it on the same dimensions as the Kaaba. And that was where the Khalif would meditate. You know. You know, and then in the inner, the inner, inner courtyard, it has like um, they they made like streams, you know, gardens and streams, like Allah describes heaven under which rivers flow, and there's there's orange trees, and so she said to us, okay, so they're they're, they're short, like one meter high, and she said, do you know why the orange trees are one meter tall? Why did they grow them one meter tall? And I said, I don't know. She said because they wanted to show people. The heaven is within reach for everybody. <laughs> heaven is within reach for everybody. And then she said, so why do they really allow them to grow with so many orange trees? Almost like an abundance of orange, oranges on the orange trees. She said, we don't know, she said, to make it so that they realize that there's enough for everybody in heaven. You know. And it, it's interesting, it's symbolic. And some symbolism is really amazing when you see that in the land of it. How they figured it out, how they worked it. It was really, your mind is blown, particularly in the Alhambra Palace. You know? Uh, and so, this is, I think, Alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a good eye opener for all of us when we encounter land. But the main thing is the lesson that we learn, you know, the mistakes that we make, that we learn in hindsight, that shouldn't be done. We don't make the same mistakes. And also that we feel proud about our history and our civilization, that Muslims did this. And they were way, way ahead of their time, you know. And you know, when good leaders are in place, like Al-Rahman the Third, for example, and others, you know, they they they, they made a society. They they built well, like al hakam the Second. He built 26 makatib for disabled students. They had provisions for blind people. You know, they had money stipends for those who are disabled, and they had all these beautiful things. And that's really the the goodness of human society. May Allah grant all of us to feed. Amen. And 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 guide all of us to all that is beloved to Him. Amen. Uh, I want to say one more thing, but I, I think I have to say. I have to say. Right? Okay. Yeah. So.
Okay. So you know, someone asked me like you know, this time, what is the main lesson we learn from Alandalus? And I said to him, I said, you know, what I think the main lesson, because all lessons Allah gives us in the Quran and the prophetic tradition, all lessons that's worthy for us and valuable for us in the Quran and prophetic tradition. Now in the Quran, I wanted to think about this for a moment. You know, Allah. Think about two prophets, Dawood and Sulaiman. Dawood was a father, Sulaiman was a son. And Allah in the Quran says, Isbir Allah says, Be patient about what they say about you. You speak, Prophet. Uh, and remember our servant Dawood, the eighth, he had in a power, in a power of obedience to Allah, uh, and he was awab. Awab means a raji Allah, always returning his affairs to Allah. Okay? Then Allah says, Inna sakharna al jibala ma'u sabihna. Right? Uh, and Allah says, We cause the mountains to remember Allah with him. In the morning and evening. Right? And the birds above him. The birds above him. All of them were awab. All of them are returning their affairs to Allah. Then Allah says, And we gave him, Suleiman. We gave him, we gifted him Suleiman. Ni'mal abd, a good a servant. In the who he was awab, and even he ends up being awab. And you think, Subhanallah, what's happening here? That means Dawood, the father, is awab. Allah made the whole world work with him, and then they all became awab. Then his son also became becomes awab. Now something really interesting is happening here. It begins, of course, with the father Dawood <coughs> All of us, inshallah, are going to be fathers or guardians or grandfathers or you know. Older siblings, we all have re or mother's responsibility, but it begins with you, right? Like Allah reminded the Prophet, be patient what they're saying about you, bad things about you, remember him, Dawood alayhi salam. Right? Allah in the Quran is saying, Wasbir be patient about what they say about you, and remember and glorify the praises of your Lord in the morning and in the evening. Be zakir of Allah. Always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Dawood alayhi salam. Right? Now look. Look at his son Sulaiman alayhi salam. You know Sulaiman asked Allah for dua. He asked Allah for mulkan alayhim <coughs> For a kingdom that nobody else will have a claim to. Sulaiman. He had kingdom. So he had jinn working with him. He had the wind. Sulaiman al-Sifa. Allah says with Sulaiman was a strong wind that would go to with him to the Beit al the Holy Land. You know, he had the jinn in his army. He had power. I mean, he had power. Al-Aqsa, Al-Andalus is nothing compared to what Sulaiman al Islam had. Now look at this. This is all about landscaping, like mentioned, transitioning from place to place. We don't, our lives, we don't live in static places. We don't live in only one place. We move and we see and we observe. Sulaiman al Islam, in Surah Al-Naml, about the ants, Surah of the ants, Allah says, Wa husha li Sulaiman, Gathered before Sulaiman was his army of humans and jinn and birds, and they're all assembled and arranged. Now Allah says, وَحُشَرَ Not hashara, not that he gathered everything, but it was arranged for him. What comes to your mind when you think of that? You think of power. Power, strength. That means he must really be in control. If every everything being arranged for him, he's really in control. Okay, human, jinn, birds, everything. Now then Allah says next verse, <coughs> until they come to the valley of the ants. It's in the chapter of the ants. The valley of the ants. Qalat namlatun, the female ant speaks and says, Ya yuhan naml, o ants, udkhulu masakinakum, enter your homes. You don't want Suleiman and his army to crush you while they don't perceive they're going to crush you. Now what's happened here? Suleiman and his army, they've transitioned from a place of power and strength to a place of weakness. To a place of really nothingness. It's a value, so it's down. And this is a value of the ants and ants, you can't even see the ants. But Allah says it's the valley, it's the valley where the ants are. So all of that power power and the strength and everything is now moving 
Suleiman is all that seeing all of that power, he's now moving to a place where it's just nothing. This is other people are there, other things are creatures are there. But whoever is there, the vulnerable, the ant still has a voice. And the female ant, the queen ant will speak because she has a voice that Allah gave her to speak and then has a right and a privilege to speak and says, Oh ants, enter your what? Not your like your da, manzil, enter your second, your masakinukum, enter your not your houses. Not these small simple things you've made for yourself, enter your homes. And a home is a place where there is warmth and there is trust and there is family and there is, you know, sense of you can live in the home. Peace. The Prophet says when you're going to the mosque, you hear the iqama being called, don't run. Wa alaykum as sakina and upon you to be at peace. Allah said between a man and a wife, wa min ayati and khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwaja li tasku ilayha. Allah has made, you know, from the signs of Allah, is it Allah has put between the man and the wife? So you could find tranquility and peace in each other. Right? And so Allah says, the ant says, enter your homes. May they also have homes. Ants have homes. Right? Now, what an amazing realization. Now, Suleiman, what happens? Next verse. Suleiman smiled when he heard those words. Right? That's not a tyrant. He smiled when he heard those words. Now one, look at the tr transitioning. So you're going from the place of uh, power to the place of vulnerability, but still important because that's your responsibility. And that the third one is above him. Above him, but it's found within himself. So Allah says, he smiled and laughed. What he said, فقال, he made a dua to Allah. He says, Rabbi awzi'ani. أن أشكر نعمتك التي نعمت عليه وعلى والديه وأن أعمل صالحا ترضاه وأدخلني برحمتك في أبادك الصالحين. My Lord, inspire me to thank you for what you've blessed me with and blessed my parents with, and for me to do good actions that you're pleased with, and for me to enter by your mercy وأدخلني برحمتك أنتي by your mercy amongst your pious servants. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, that's his, that's where he's taking his whole observation here. Yeah, you're going from the power to the place of just the ants. Now, but then of course it goes back all of it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and I think whenever I think of al Andalus, I think of that. I think about the fact that you're you're moving landscapes, you're transitioning through space. You're not always going to have the power. And even if you don't, if you enter a place where there's going to be vulnerable people, like my khutbah today was about it was about child exploitation, about exploiting children. What is it? You have in children vulnerability. The Prophet says, I, I, I make inviolable haram, you know, two, the rights of two. One are the orphans, the other are the women, because there's vulnerability there. Child is vulnerable. The Prophet was giving the khutbah in the masjid. When Al Hassan came in the masjid, and he tripped over. The Prophet's grandson tripped over and he started crying, Hassan. And the Prophet left the khutbah. Go, went to him, picked him up, kissed him, and went back to the khutbah. This vulnerability there. This you don't lose sight of the element of, of mercy that really binds our religion. May Allah grant all of us tawfiq. Sorry for overtaking the thing to May Allah grant all of us tawfiq. Uh, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الحمد لله العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وفي النار ربنا ولم ننقصنا وان لم تغفر لنا ونصحنا من الخاسرين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو تعف عنا اللهم أفرج علينا الصبر وثبت قدامنا ونصرنا كم الكافرين يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا لذينك يا مصرف القلوب صرف قلوبنا طاعتك يا رحمة رحيمين اللهم أغفر لنا يا كريم رحيم يا رحمة رحيمين اللهم أعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم أعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم أعتق رقابنا جميعا من النار اللهم إن نسألك الفدوس الأعلى اللهم إن نسألك الفدوس الأعلى اللهم إن نسألك الفدوس الأعلى رحمة الله عالمين اللهم أصلح فساد قلوبنا وطهر قلوبنا من الذي فاقوا عمالنا من الذي يا رحمة الحمين اللهم زدنا وعدنا قسمنا 
واكفئنا ولا تهنا واعطنا ولا تحرمنا اللهم انا نعوذ بك من زوال نعمتك وتحول عافيتك وفجاءة نقمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم لا تحرمنا خير ما عندك بسوء ما عندنا اللهم لا تحرمنا خير ما عندك بسوء ما عندنا اللهم لا تحرمنا خير ما عندك بسوء ما عندنا يا رب اغفر لنا يا كريم اللهم انجل المستوضع في المسلمين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم عليك بأداء الدين اللهم دمر أداء الدين اللهم اكفني بما شئت اللهم اكفني بما شئت اللهم اكفني بما شئت اللهم فكك إلى أصل المسلمين اللهم كن لهم معين ونصير يا رحم الرحيمين يا رب اكفر لنا وحمنا إنك أنت الله الرحيم يا رحم الرحيمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيد محمد والحمد لله العالمين Thank you.